Good afternoon. My name is James Marshall from the London office of Taylor Wessing, and I'm joined this afternoon by my colleagues Judith Krenz in our Amsterdam office and Matthias Husevich in our Dusseldorf office. Welcome to part nine of our series of Countdown to the UPC webinars. This afternoon, uh, we will be giving the first of two webinars dealing with the important area of evidence. Under the UPC agreement, the means of giving or obtaining evidence uh, to prove a party's case in a UPC action falls into various categories. The UPC agreement provides for such matters as hearing the parties, requests for information, production of documents, hearing of witnesses, opinions by experts, inspection, conducting experiments, and sworn statements in writing. These are described in expanded form in the corresponding parts of the rules of procedure, which specifically refer, in addition, to such matters as written evidence, experts' reports, uh, and reports of experiments. Now, this is a long list, and evidence in the UPC is a large and important subject. Therefore, we will follow this webinar with another one in May, which will address the subjects of expert evidence, experiments, and the related issues of confidentiality and privilege. So for today, we're going to focus on two main areas. Firstly, the duty on a party to produce documents. And secondly, the specific measures, uh, that is the powers of the court, to make orders to produce evidence, orders to preserve evidence, re referred to in the rules of procedure as the SAZ, orders to inspect premises, and orders to communicate information. To orientate ourselves by reference to the UPC agreement, uh, we will be focusing mainly on Articles 53 to 55, which deal with the means of evidence and burden of proof, and on Articles 59 and 60, which address the specific court orders or the powers of the court to make orders to produce evidence and to preserve evidence and inspect premises. These are expanded upon in the rules of procedure, uh, which are rules 170 to 172 and 190 to 199. In the UK, of course, we've had a long history of disclosure or discovery of documents, inspection of processes, and in certain very limited situations, uh, search orders. The provisions in the UPC agreement regarding the orders that a court uh, may make that we will be discussing this afternoon are, to a large extent, well, closely based on the equivalent provisions of the IP Enforcement Directive, which of course has been applied now across Europe for some 10 years. The provisions of the UPC agreement are, are as I say, supplemented by the provisions of the Rules of Procedure. In the UPC, the panels of judges will of course be multinational. Judith, Matthias and I each feel confident, based on our experience of them over the years, that we can predict to a large extent the likely approach to these UPC provisions the judges of our respective countries will take. For my part, I'm not sure the approach will necessarily always be exactly the same, in the early years at least. But by pooling our experiences uh, together, uh, we are aimed today is to provide some insight into how we think the multinational judicial panels in the UPC division, divisions will approach these matters. Before we get onto the detailed substance, may I just make two requests? Firstly, please feel free to email us questions, which you can do by using the purple Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We will endeavour to respond to these as soon as we can after this webinar. Uh, secondly, 
If you're able to stay online for just a moment after we finish, you will see a very short survey appear. It would be enormously helpful to us and we'd be very grateful if you could fill that out and let us know what you thought of this web webinar and what other issues you might like to hear about in future webinars. Just before we talk about the detail of the evidence and powers of court in this uh, provisions, as it has been a while since our last UPC webinar, let us first just remind ourselves of what has been happening and what the status of the court and the unitary patent is now. In fact, since our last webinar, there was a hiatus of nearly five months sparked by the results of the UK referendum on membership of the European Union. The decision of the UK to leave the EU uh, in the near future for a while through the future of the UPC and the unitary pattern into doubt because, of course, ratification uh, of the UPC by the UK is mandatory before it could come into force. And it was, no, it was certainly not clear in the early months after the referendum whether or not the UK was going to ratify. Happily, however, the UK Minister of State for Energy and Intellectual Property, Baroness Neville Rolfe, did indeed announce on the 28th of November that the UK would indeed ratify the UPC agreement. There have been a number of legal opinions arguing that the UK could, with amendments to the governing instruments, continue to take part in the UPC after the UK leaves the EU, the likely date for which will be sometime in late March 2019, two years after the UK gives the so-called Article 50 notice expected later this month, uh, following the passage of the relevant Act last night by the UK Parliament. It's interesting uh, that in a recent explanatory memorandum relating to the Protocol on Privileges and in Immunities of the UPC, and signed by the relevant UK Government Minister, emphasis was placed on the fact that the UPC is an intergovernmental court rather than a UK court. In the meantime, 12 ratification, ratifications of the UP, UPC agreement are now in place, meaning that the only ratifications of the agreement by the UK and Germany are needed, uh, and those are both uh, expected soon. The two protocols, the Protocol on Provisional Application, the Protocol on Privileges and Immunities, need to be signed. Uh, assuming these are in place by May, the Preparatory Committee can keep to its proposed timetable in which a provisional period for the UPC, when judges will be appointed, will start in May, uh, followed by a full opening on the 1st of December. According to this timetable, there would also be a sunrise period starting in September in which opt-outs of European patents, classical European patents, can start to be lodged. We will, of course, be continuing to monitor the timetable closely and update uh, in future webinars. So let's turn to the substance of the webinar. By first looking at who carries the burden of proving the case in the UPC, the starting point for dealing with evidence is the usual rule uh, that the burden of proving facts is on the party relying on those facts. This is made express in the UPC agreement, Article 54. So in most cases before the court, this means that it, it is for the party bringing an infringement case to prove infringement and the party bringing a revocation action to prove the patent is invalid. Just before coming on to the tools by which evidence to prove facts can be obtained, it is worth noting in passing the express provision of the reversal of the burden of proof as to the use of patented processes to make new products. This provision, of course, is common in national laws and it was expressly included in, as Article 55 in the UPC agreement. This, of course, in the past has had its main application uh, in the enforcement of pharmaceutical process patents in those countries when, at the time the patent 
was granted product patents were not available uh, under national law for new pharmaceuticals. The UPC agreement simply adopts the wording of Article 34 of the 1994 TRIPS International Agreement, uh, including its uh, optional second limb. And those are set out on the slide before you. Now, offering of evidence and the duty to produce evidence. The rules of procedure make clear that a statement of fact that is not specifically contested by any party must be taken as true as between them. As is usual, therefore, it will be important to make sure in the written procedure stages that all factual assertions made by the opposing party are specifically addressed. In addition to that, where a party wishes to rely on a statement of fact which is contested or likely to be contested, it must indicate the so-called means of evidence that it claims will prove that fact. Furthermore, in addition to this indication, it is important to note there is a duty again made express in the rules of procedure, a duty on a party actually to produce the evidence that is available to it uh, regarding a contested statement of fact, uh, or one likely to be contested, that that party is making. The words available and regarding here raise some issues of interpretation. As regards the evidence being available to a party, on a narrow interpretation, this could be understood to mean documents of which the party is aware. But on a broader and objective interpretation, it could be understood to mean documents that uh, can be located uh, as a result of an internal search. In other words, does this an automatic duty on a party making a factual assertion carry with it a duty to make a reasonable search of evidence within that party's control through company systems, archives, and, and so forth, whether or not they're aware of the existence of that document at the outset. The evidence to be produced by the party making an assertion of fact must also be, quote, regarding the fact. It's notable that this word has been chosen instead of narrower terms that could have been used, such as proving or supporting, the clear in inference seems to be that it is intended to be broad enough to include evidence not only that supports the party's case, but rather like in UK disclosure, that evidence that adversely affects it or undermines it, presumably though subject to questions of privilege. The interpretation of these words in time by the court uh, will have a significant impact on the uh, scope and nature of this duty to produce evidence. Uh, but the overall principle seems to be towards uh, a duty of openness on the part of a party making factual assertions. In addition, parties will be well advised to have in mind when making factual assertions in the written phases that the duty to produce evidence is backed up by the power of the court to compel that party to produce specific evidence that lies within its control. It may be, in certain circumstances, that the court will make an order uh, requiring an internal search for, for evidence within the party's control. And note also that a failure by a party to produce evidence that has been ordered shall be taken into consideration by the court when deciding on the issue concerned. In other words, the court shall draw whatever inference it, can, it considers appropriate from the absence of uh, any evidence being produced. Just returning to the obligation on the parties to indicate the means of evidence to prove their case and to produce evidence. The indication of the means of evidence, uh, except when they are readily available, requires that the 
a statement describing the existence and the nature of the material uh, relied upon. The place to do this, of course, is in the parties' respective written pleadings during the written procedure. The statement of claim, the statement of defence, the reply, uh, rejoinder, and so on, uh, are required to contain the evidence where it's available and an indication of any further evidence that may be offered in support. Uh, secondly, as regards producing documents, uh, this means making them physically available to the other party uh, and the court so that they may be uh, reviewed. As I say, the basic duty on the party to produce uh, all statements regarding a statement of fact that party makes appears to be intended to ensure uh, what is considered to be a fair cards on the table approach to litigation in the UPC. That is relevant position in the, sorry, that is relevant material in the possession of one party that would support or undermine a statement that it is making that should not be kept from the other or, or even produced late in the proceedings. As mentioned earlier, the general obligation to produce evidence is supplemented and supported by other specific measures or court powers that enable certain evidence to be obtained from opponents and in some cases third parties. To obtain orders from each, from each of these measures, the parties must lodge a specific application. And the court powers uh, at high level uh, can be summarized as follows. Obtaining uh, an order that the opposing party or a third party uh, may produce evidence. The communication of banking, financial or commercial documents under the control of the opposing party. Provisional measures to preserve relevant evidence. Uh, and the inspection of premises. I'm now going to hand over to Judith, who's going to look at some of the common features that arise with uh, all of these applications and the specifics of the order to preserve evidence and the order for inspection. Judith. Thank you, James. Given the number of UPC divisions spread across uh, Europe, one of the first matters to consider for an applicant is in which division the applicant for the preservation and or inspection order should be lodged. This will be the division where the applicant has begun the proceedings on the merits or where the applicant intends to begin those proceedings. This is the local or regional division hosted by a contracting member state where the alleged infringement is occurring or may occur or where the defendant has its residence or principal place of business, or, in the event that the defendant hasn't such evidence, the central division. Which branch of the central division depends on the technology that is, subject, uh, that is a subject matter of the patent? The party um, seeking a preservation and or inspection order from the court must also support it with reasons based on reasonably available evidence. This requirement to support the reasons with reasonably available evidence is transcription from the enforcement directive. And it might be criticized on the basis that it's the very aim of the orders to obtain such evidence in the first place. But the evidence referred to is circumstantial that which infers the likely existence of the specific evidence sought. The requirement to have this circumstantial evidence is one of the safeguards against abuse of this measure. That's an important issue that Matthias will deal with in more detail shortly. And it's going to be up to the judges to adopt, uh, to adopt a practice on this issue that strikes the correct balance. Another uh, common issue arising from preservation and inspection orders, as well as orders to communicate and to produce evidence, as James has already highlighted, is confidentiality. The need to respect the defendant's 
confidential information has to be balanced with the right of the applicant to obtain evidence of infringing procedures or products. In order to do so, the UPC agreement provides the measures seeking evidence are subject to the protection of, com of confidential information. And as James said, we are going to deal with confidentiality in more detail in our next uh, webinar in May. But I will mention here that, it's, that this is a particularly important issue when preservation orders are made. And as another safeguard for defendants, there is a prohibition on the applicant being present during entry to the defendant's premises. So, let's now turn to the order to preserve evidence specifically. This is often referred to as a saisie, although it's different in important respects from the saisie contre façon familiar in France, particularly as regards the safeguards that Matthias will discuss. Orders to preserve evidence in the UPC may include, but they're not limited to, a detailed description, either with or without taking of samples, physical seizure of allegedly infringing goods, physical seizure of the materials or implements used in the production or distribution of these goods, and any related documents, as well as preservation and disclosure of digital media and data, and the disclosure of any passwords necessary to access them. It should be remembered that the preservation order is a means of obtaining evidence. It's specifically not intended to be used as a means to stop the use of the allegedly infringing goods or processes. Instead, it's only the amount of goods necessary for the probative purpose of the order that must be seized. Furthermore, the evidence which has to be preserved through this type of order may not be used for the purpose of other proceedings, except when otherwise ordered by the court. A preservation order is enforceable immediately, again, unless otherwise ordered by the court. And the preservation order may um, specify um, who is to uh, represent the applicant when executing the order and under what conditions. It may further specify any security that must be provided by the applicant against damage, should it later be held that the order should not have been granted. Uh, penalties applicable to the applicant may be set by the court in the event that the conditions are not met, and the order must also indicate that it can be appealed. Now, orders of inspection. The order for inspection is similar to the order to preserve evidence, but it doesn't include the seizing of samples or documentation. Instead, the purpose is the inspection of products, devices, methods, premises, or what are referred to as local situations of material that may be deemed useful to resolve the case. Clearly, such an order may need to be combined with a preservation order, and the requirements in the rules of procedure are the same. And, also like others, for preservation, the evidence obtained by an inspection order may not be used for the purpose of other proceedings, again, except when otherwise ordered. Like a preservation order, this measure is again enforceable immediately, and again, unless otherwise ordered, and it may specify, again, who is to be to represent the applicant when executing the order and under what conditions, and secondly, any security that must be provided by the applicant. Any penalties applicable to the applicant may be set by the court in the event that these conditions are not met, and the order must also indicate that it can be appealed.
An application for an order to preserve evidence or for inspection must be made by a party to the appropriate division, as I said before. The application must also contain the numerous particulars stipulated for a statement of claim by the rules of procedure in an infringement action, as well as a clear indication of the measures being requested. If the application is being made before proceedings on the merits have been lodged, it must contain a concise description of the action on the merits that will be lodged, including an indication of the facts and evidence that the applicants will rely on. Importantly, these applications may be made ex parte, that is, without the presence of the defendant. If an applicant wants an order made ex parte, they must set out the reasons why the uh, defendant shouldn't be heard, and in particular whether delay is likely to cause irreparable harm to the applicant, or that there is a demonstrable risk of evidence being destroyed or otherwise ceasing um, to be available. Also, urgency can be important. The applicant is also under a duty to disclose any material fact known to it which might influence the court in deciding whether to make an order without hearing the defendant. Furthermore, the application will not be entered on the register until notice has been given to the defendant. Matthias will come back to ex parte applications in a second. The formalities of the application are that if proceedings on the merits have not yet been lodged, the application will be examined by the registry. Its date of receipt will be recorded in the register, an action number will be assigned, and it will be assigned to a panel or a judge rapporteur. If the main proceedings on the merits have already um, commenced, the application will be examined by the registry immediately and can be forwarded to the panel or the judge to whom the action on the merits is assigned. The timing of the application is important if it's made before the beginning of the proceedings on the merits because it determines that the date by which these proceedings must be started, proceedings on the merits must begin within 31 calendar days or 20 working days of the date contained in the order. Failure of the applicant to do this will enable the defendant to request the revocation of the order or that it otherwise ceases to have effect and a potential claim to damages. Circumstances may arise in which the preservation and or inspection is needed extremely urgently. In this case, the applicant may apply without any formality for the order to the standing judge, who will decide the procedure to be followed, which may include a subsequent written application. Then the oral hearing. The oral hearing of an application for an order to preserve evidence and or an order for inspection will be set as soon as possible after the date of receiving the application. The oral hearing is conducted as for an action on the merits and the application may be rejected by the court if the applicant is absent without any reasonable excuse. The decision of the court must be given in writing as soon as possible after the close of the oral hearing, and it may even be given orally at the event of the hearing, followed as soon as um, reasonable possible in writing. However, if the hearing took place ex parte, within 30 days after the execution of the measures, the defendant may request a review of the order to preserve evidence and or inspection order that was granted. Such a request must set out the reasons why the order should be revoked or modified and facts and evidence relied on. 
the court must then order an oral hearing to review the order without delay, further to which the order may be either revoked, modified, or confirmed. So, as you've heard, preservation orders and inspection orders may sometimes be obtained ex parte. And I have already mentioned some of the safeguards um, this power is subject to. Given the nature of this power, it is of particular interest to explain more about it and to discuss the order, other orders that James referred to. I'm handing over to Matthias in Dusseldorf. Matthias. Thank you, Judith. Yes, so let's step back a little to look at ex parte preservation and our inspection orders. In common with applications for provisional measures, which we discussed in part five of our UPC webinar series, the court examining an application for an order to preserve evidence or inspection has the discretion to choose between a number of options. It may choose whether to hear the application ex parte or inter partes, and also whether the defendant may lodge an objection to the application. Specifically, the court has the discretion to inform the defendant about the application and invite it to lodge within a specified time period an objection to the application for preserving evidence. Second, summon both parties to an oral hearing. Third, summon the applicant to an oral hearing without the presence of the defendant. And uh, fourth, decide the application without having heard the defendant. In exercising its discretion on these options, as, as uh, Judith already mentioned, the court has to take into account the urgency of the action, in particular the risk of irreparable harm that would be caused by delay. The rules do not appear to set out that urgency is mandatory for the granting of measures. As, as uh, Judith also noted, the court must also consider the probability that the evidence may be destroyed or otherwise cease to be available. And it must take into account whether other reasons for not hearing the defendant put forward by the applicant are well founded. These are likely to include submissions on the merits of the case, although the rules do not expressly say so. If the court decides that it, would, it, that it will inform the defendant about the application or the patent at issue is the subject, for example, of a protective letter, the applicant will first be given the opportunity to withdraw the application. If this happens, the applicant can request that the existence of the application and its contents are kept confidential. If the court decides to invite the defendant to lodge an objection, the objection must contain the reasons why the application should fail. The facts and evidence relied on, in particular, any challenge to the facts and evidence relied on by the applicant and where the main action on the merits has not yet been lodged, the reasons the action on the merits itself should fail. So, as I have explained, even before the orders are granted, the court has the discretionary power to inform the defendant about the application and to ask it to lodge an objection. Therefore, the rules in principle open a way for the court or the, also for the judge rapporteur to avoid the defendant being taken by surprise. The defendant is also afforded some other protection against the abuse of the ex parte preservation and inspection power, some of which Judith has um, touched on. At the time that an ex parte order is executed, the defendant must also be given notice immediately. In the 30 days following the execution of the measure, the defendant may then lodge a request for review of the order which parallels the application as it must contain the reasons supported by facts and evidence why the order should be revoked. Furthermore, in the event of the order being revoked, revoked or lapsing because of the action or lack thereof of the applicant, or when the proceedings on the merits end by finding there was no infringement of all, threat of infringement, the defendant may receive compensation. Another protection is provided by the bar 
on the applicant being present during the execution of the measures. This is, an, this is in order to preserve confidentiality and avoid suspicions of industrial spying. The applicant may, however, be represented as long at, le as long at least as the representative is not an employee or a director of the applicant. The person carrying out the measures must be a professional person or expert designated by the court with regard to their expertise, independence, and impartiality. The court also has a general discretion to order the applicant to provide an adequate security, for example, by a deposit or by a bank guarantee, in order for the legal costs and other expenses and for the compensation for any injury incurred or likely to be incurred by the defendant. However, the court must order the applicant to provide such a security if the order was made without hearing the defendant other than in special circumstances. The order of evidence and the order for inspection have the same aim. Finding evidence the opposing party or a third party may be inclined to destroy or change. For this reason, both orders heavily rely on the fact of surprise. Giving notice to the author of an alleged infringement would allow time to destroy or hide evidence of any product or process that is infringing the patentee's rights. Therefore, the possibility of requesting an order without the defending being notified of the request and consequently not being permitted to argue against it prior to grant is crucial to that system. However, making a decision in an action without the defending being heard is a breach of the adversarial rules principle that both parties have the opportunity to put their case. This is a core principle for a fair trial, and so in the UPC, it was considered important to provide the courts with the power to order the preservation of evidence and or inspection ex parte only if necessary. This means that in the UPC, procedures for obtaining evidence from opponents ex parte are only an exception to the general principle that both parties should be heard inter parte. The apparent limiting of ex parte preservation or inspection orders to exceptional circumstances in this way may be perceived to constitute a distinction of the UPC from many European systems. For instance, German courts with regard to inspection orders tend to be reluctant in terms of informing the defendant beforehand since they perceive there is a risk that evidence may be destroyed and all the the object of inspection may be altered. Therefore, it remains to be seen eventually how the UPC will handle this situation in practice. German judges in the UPC will, for these reasons, likely tend to follow the this approach of UPC then. So, I'm now going to move on from preservation and inspection orders to discuss two other types of evidence gathering measures. These are the orders that compel parties to produce certain information, which James mentioned briefly at the beginning of this webinar. They are the orders to produce evidence and the order to communicate information. Orders to produce evidence and to communicate information supplement the general obligation to produce documents regarding statements of facts that James also explained, although they are also available against third parties. They may also be used to obtain banking, financial, or commercial documents from an opposing party. They reflect the practice adopted by most civil law systems where, in the absence of a general duty of disclosure, the only means for a party to access documentation relating to the matter which is in possession or control of its opponent is to specifically ask the court for the documents. Orders to produce specified evidence in the control of the opposing party or a third party may be requested by a party during the interim or the written procedure before the UPC. 
To obtain the order, the applicant must list the reasons why the order ought to be granted by the court and support with reasonably available and plausible evidence. The inference of this prerequisite seems to be that to ask the court to order the opposing party or a third party to disclose supplementary evidence, one must have knowledge of the existence of the evidence rather than a mere supposition. It will be necessary for the judges to adopt an approach to this issue that distinguishes between the two. Finally, party may also apply to the court for an order that an infringer informs the applicant of the origin and distribution channels of the infringing products or processes. The quantities produced, manufactured, delivered, received, ordered, as well as the price obtained for the infringing products and the identity of any third person involved in the production or distribution of the infringing products or in the use of the infringing process. Using this measure, the claimant is able to acquire information from the infringer about the distribution channel and the quantity of infringing products in order to assist in the proceeding. This information can also be used to identify third parties that have taken part in the infringing activities in order to inform subsequent litigation before the court. In order to communicate information, can also be directed against the third party who was involved in the infringing activities on a commercial scale. In particular, this includes a party who was found in the position of the infringing product or to be using an infringing process, found to be providing services used in infringing activities, or was indicated to be involved in the production, manufacture, distribution of the infringing product. The request for information under this power must be justified and proportionate. This appears to mean that any information sought must be reasonably necessary for the purpose of advancing the claim of the case. The information is, like evidence obtained under the other measures discussed in this webinar, also subject to potential confidentiality principles. Finally, please note that it is unclear that in order to communicate information, it is a final remedy The articles of the agreement and the rules are ambiguous, um, eventually ambiguous on this issue when looked at together. Thank you very much, Matthias. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Carry on. No, I just wanted to hand over to you. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much, Matthias. And uh, that concludes uh, our first of two webinars on the subject of evidence. All it remains for me uh, to say is to thank you to all our um, participants very much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. As I say, there is more to say on the, uh, the question of evidence in the UPC. Our next webinar will be on it will be part 10 in our series, and that will take place on the 2nd of May. Uh, and in that webinar, we will be discussing uh, written evidence, particularly expert evidence, uh, and the related matters of experiments, together with the important issues of confidentiality and privilege. But as from today, that is, um, concludes uh, first part and thank you very much to everybody and hopefully we will uh, uh, you will be able to join us for the next one thank you goodbye